Uh, every emotion is, is intensified when you, you think you're going to die sooner rather than later. It's a life and death matter. I'm not standing in the grocery store trying to decide which kind of Pepperidge Farm cookies I want. It's my life. I'm one of the few people who is speaking about AIDS uh, who has it. It's affecting children. It's affecting women. Uh, prostitutes in New York City have AIDS. They're having sex with men who go back to San Antonio, Texas or Cincinnati, Ohio to their families. It, it has to, we have to stop perceiving this as a gay disease. It is not a gay disease. Sometimes I feel like a, a time bomb on a battlefield. You know, as I go to funerals and memorials, I wonder, am I next? We're all ultimately alone with our maker at the time of our death. But in the meantime, all we really have is each other. We've always belonged together. We will always belong together. Just keep moving on. Just keep moving on. Anything you do, let it come from you. Then it will be new. I'll give you more to see. I was uh, born and raised in Houston, Texas. I was born in 1952. I have uh, two older brothers. I'm the youngest of three boys. And I finally arrived here in New York City uh, on the 2nd of January in 1973. I knew that I was at risk because I fit. I was in the age range. I was a sexually active gay man living in an urban center like New York. Um, when I, I first saw a purple spot on my leg, I, I feared the worst. And when it didn't go away, I went to my doctor who sent me to a dermatologist who biopsied it and it came back positive. Kaposi sarcoma. That was February of 84. I left the, the dermatologist's office, which was on Washington Square, and it was a bright, sunny day, but it was also very cold. I was in a, like a state of shock, and all of that that was happening around me didn't really register. It was like I had entered another dimension. And I really thought I was going to die soon, very soon. I went to Sal's after he was home from work. And he was lying on his bed in the bedroom with the lights out. And I remember standing in the doorway of his bedroom saying, our greatest fears are founded. And he rushed to me and held on to me tightly. And, and I started crying for the first time since I was told and he was crying and I remember feeling a kind of a release to be in his arms and to have my arms around him and we stood there crying for a, a while and finally he helped me get out of all my winter 
clothes and we laid on the bed and we started to calm down and we started talking about what we were going to do and he said to me that we had weathered other storms together and although this was more serious than anything before we were going to go through this together not a day goes by not a single day you're not somewhere a part of my life and i need you to stay as the days go by i keep does it end that it can't get much better much longer but it only gets better and stronger and deeper and nearer and simpler and freer and richer and clearer and no not a day goes by I know a lot of people with AIDS who are alone don't have anyone and it's that much more difficult when you're going through something like this by yourself and you don't so I'm, I'm blessed and I have not a day goes by that I don't thank God that I have Sal and our love is more intense than it ever was before our relationship and our bond is stronger less sexual perhaps but more loving and intimate About two months after I was diagnosed, I came down with something called herpes zoster, or the shingles. It's a nervous disorder, and it was pretty apparent to me and my doctors that it was a, a nervous reaction uh, to my diagnosis, my AIDS diagnosis. Sal works, so I was here alone during the day, and I called my mother in Texas and asked her if she would come up here and, and take care of me for a while. I thought she would cook for me and, and care for me and bring me Coca-Colas like she did when I was sick as a child, but uh, I was wrong. She, she arrived here and she was very, very frightened. She was even afraid to touch me. And I took her to my doctors with me and they, they spoke to her and I think that helped. But she was very uncomfortable and, and therefore I was even more uncomfortable having her here. She went back to Texas after about four days and I was relieved that, that she left because my gay friends, my, my gay family were taking care of me. Sal was here constantly as much as he could be. Other friends were here uh, feeding me and feeding my cat and, and one friend even cleaned my apartment. Well, my mother wrote me a letter not too long after that and said, David, I, I don't think you should come home because you'll only make everyone uncomfortable and I don't think you should tell anyone in the family about your illness. And this really devastated me. Uh, I was at the lowest I had ever been physically and, and emotionally and, and I, I really felt that she had turned her back on me. Um, I subsequently wrote her and said, I'd like to know that I could come home if I wanted to, which I don't. And I said that I don't think you have any right to tell me not to speak to my brothers about my illness. They have a right to know and we're all adults and if they don't understand I can try and help them understand and if they still reject me then at least my cards are on the table 
And I said I would rather they hear about it from me than to see me on the Phil Donahue show. And coincidentally, about 10 months later, I was on the Phil Donahue show. And when the show aired in Texas, my mother called me and with tears she told me how proud she was of me. Haven't some of your technicians here at NBC walked off your set today because I have AIDS? Yes. Is that not true? The answer to your question is yes. Then that answers your question. There is well, a definite need for education. She said, David, I'm so very proud of you. And I started crying. And that, that was a turning point in her accepting my illness and, and, and being able to at least speak about it. In the beginning, I did think I was going to die. That was my first reaction. And I also did not want to be around other AIDS patients. And I told Sal that the last thing I wanted was to sit in a room with other people with AIDS. But in those first couple of weeks when I was going to so many doctors, uh, one day I was sitting in a, a waiting room of a doctor's office and a fellow that I knew came in and he, I knew he had been living with AIDS for about two years. And I started talking to him and I realized how many questions I had that were unanswered. Like, uh, how did you tell your family? And, and uh, how does your lover treat you? And do you still have sex? I mean, pretty basic questions. And, and he was very loving and generous with his advice. And, and uh, I, I realized that I was being foolish to not accept the help and the support that was being offered. So I joined a support group for KS, Kaposi sarcoma patients uh, at, at Gaiman's Health Crisis. And now, almost two years later, I'm a volunteer there and, and I feel strong physically and emotionally to, to even reach out to other AIDS patients. But in the beginning, I needed the help. And, and they were there for me. Gay Men's Health Crisis? Wherever uh, there is a, a large gay population, which is in every urban center in the country, there is an organization like GMHC, and they are the real heroes, people who are unselfishly giving of themselves to those of us who are dealing with this illness. I, I see incredibly heroic acts daily. When, when I was diagnosed, people who were total strangers to me reached out to me in, in the most unbelievable ways. Something is stirring, shifting ground, it's just begun. Edges are blurring all around, and yesterday is done. Feel the flow, hear what's happening, hear what's happening. Don't you know, we're the movers and we're the shapers, we're the names in tomorrow's papers, up to us, man, to show them. It's our time, breathe it in, worlds to change and worlds to win. Our turn, coming through, me and you, man, me and you. I have a lot of help and support from Sal, and my friends, my doctors, my psychiatrists, from Gaiman's Health Crisis. But the decision to, to go on with my life is my own. I, I couldn't do it by myself, but I feel that I made that choice. And it's a powerful affirmation for me to think of myself as the hero of my own life. It's our heads on the block. Give us room and start the clock. Our time coming through. Me and you, pal, me and you. Me and you. I saw a need that I could fill. 
I believe that people need to to hear the truth. There is so much misinformation and I thought that I could perhaps calm some of the hysteria by being open and, and honest about it. And I saw the need for the public to be able to humanize AIDS, to be able to put a face on it. We talk about AIDS as the judgment of God upon moral perversion in this society. At the very least, there should be a quarantine of all homosexuals, drug abusers, and prostitutes with the Frank disease AIDS. It still upsets me when I realize how much intolerance there is in the world and lack of compassion. And that, that anger has really motivated me in many ways. I think the most visible thing I've done is get arrested when I was uh, entering City Hall to testify before the Health Committee. Uh, most of them have never even met a person with AIDS. They've never even laid eyes on a person with AIDS. And they're making all these grand pronouncements about what is and what isn't happening. And I'm saying, look, you know, I'm dealing with it every day. This is my experience. I'm, I'm not a doctor, you know, I'm not a reporter. I'm not ready to substantiate all this. I'm telling you, this is what's happening to me, David Summers, person with AIDS. And I think that when I am given the opportunity that people listen to me and they are interested in what I have to say and, and in a lot of cases moved by what I have to say. And that's, that's why I'm doing this. I want to shake people up. All that we have is each other. As I look into your faces, I see sorrow and pain. There is sickness and death all around us. But I also see hope. And it is that hope that inspires me daily to continue our fight for understanding, equality, justice. When people ask me what can they do, so many people feel helpless and they want to do something and they think that they cannot make a difference as an individual. I use Robert Kennedy's words. Let no one be discouraged by the belief there is nothing one man or one woman can do against the enormous array of the world's ills, against misery and ignorance injustice and violence. Few will have the greatness to bend history itself, but each of us can work to change a small portion of events, and in the total of all those acts will be written the history of this generation. It is from numberless diverse acts of courage and belief that human history is shaped. Each time a man stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out against injustice, he sends a tiny ripple of hope and crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring, those ripples can build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. I think that's so eloquent. It's, uh, I, I almost cry when, I, when I, I say those words. It's very moving to me. I've chosen not to begin any kind of treatment. I have about 20, 22 lesions on my body, little purple spots. Most of them are on my arms and legs. Um, 
I don't have any lesions internally or uh, affecting a vital organ. So my doctors agree that I'm doing so well this far. Uh, let's see how much further I can go. Now, I have Sal look me over uh, every couple weeks for new lesions. Mm -hmm. And I would get depressed when I would see a new lesion or he would find one on my back or my butt or... No. Just, just, just double one. And he has said to me monthly, David, you know they're going to continue. You know, why get yourself upset? Why stress yourself out? This one here on your side arm still looks a little... A little rough. Yeah. It's raised and purplish. I haven't really accepted my illness in that I won't give in to it. I won't be a victim. My opinion is that to, to allow people to call me a victim, to think of me as a victim, is, is to imply that I am helpless or that I am passive. I so. And I am anything but helpless or passive. What's really important is right here is right now, is being here with you and talking with you. Uh, the past is already done, the future is, is what it's going to be. But what I can see is, is this moment, and that's how I live my life. Somebody hold me too close, somebody hurt me too deep. Somebody sit in my chair and ruin my sleep and make me aware of being alive, being alive. My whole life is about living, about living with AIDS now, not dying with dignity. Somebody make me come through, I'll always be there, as frightened as you, to help us survive. Being alive, being alive, being alive. I think I can be a role model for other people who are diagnosed with AIDS to see that their life is not over, that they can, can lead a, a vital, creative life. Life goes on, life must go on.